There are three types of pneumonia, lobar, bronchopneumonia, interstitial pneumonia. Lobar involves just one lobe. Classically, Streptococcus pneumoniae invades the alveoli. It can move from one alveoli to the neighboring one through the pores of cone, and it can continue doing this until the entire lobe is affected. There's bronchopneumonia, which is a diffuse patchy pneumonia of one or both lungs. There's interstitial pneumonia, which is an infection of the interstitium around the alveoli or bronchioles. The infectious agent usually comes in through the oral cavity or nasal pharynx and infects the lungs. However, you can also have hematogenous spread from the blood to the lungs. To ID the microbe, usually sputum is used, but a bronchoalveolar lavage can also be used. The sample is cultured, tested, gram-stained. Sometimes those serology has to be used if the organism cannot be grown or the lab is unable to do so. Really the gold standard for pneumonia diagnosis is a chest x-ray. The clinical manifestations of bacterial pneumonia involve a sudden fever, chest pain, rapid heartbeat, rapid breathing, shortness of breath, a productive cough, that's cough with sputum, plus or minus hemoptysis, or blood. Streptococcus pneumonia is the number one cause of bacterial pneumonia. As I mentioned, it causes a low bar pneumonia. It has virulence factors, a capsule, IgA protease, pneumolysin. Pneumolysin damages host cells, causing an inflammatory response. There are two vaccines against Streptococcus pneumoniae. Haemophilus influenza type B is the number two cause of bacterial pneumonia. This organism has a polyribotyl phosphate capsule. There is also a vaccine for this organism. Staphylococcus aureus is usually a hospital-acquired pneumonia, typically in older patients or in ventilators, but there is a community-acquired pneumonia that tends to occur after influenza infections, and this can even cause infections in young people, people who are healthy. In A, it has three virulence factors. It has protein A, it has alpha toxin, and it has panton valentine leukocidin. Panton valentine leukocidin tends to be associated with a necrotizing pneumonia. Klebsiella pneumonia is an opportunistic infection causing pneumonia in those with lung disease or alcoholism. It typically causes a nosocomial bronchopneumonia or a community-acquired lobar pneumonia. You should note that it oftentimes causes destructive changes uh, with marked inflammation and hemorrhaging leading to a bloody, thick mucoid sputum. Pseudomonas aeruginosa infects people with underlying issues such as cystic fibrosis patients and those who are immunocompromised. It has many virulence factors, including two pigments, which are pyocyanin and pyoviridin. It also has a thick mucoid alginate capsule. Lastly, it has an exotoxin A, which has the same mechanism as diphtheria toxin. It ADP ribosylates EF2, inhibiting protein synthesis. Bacillus anthracis is a spore-forming aero. It has a thick polypeptide, not a polysaccharide, capsule made of poly-D-glutamic acid. An anthrax toxin has three distinct components. Two are virulence factor. There's lethal factor, which is a metalloprotease that degrades MAP kinase, killing the cell. It has edema factor, which is a adenylate cyclase, increasing cyclic AMP, so the cell loses water. Both of these agents need protective antigen to get into the cell. What happens is that spores are inhaled into the alveoli, but the spores don't germinate there. They don't grow in the lungs. They're actually taken up by alveoli and brought to the hilar and mediastinal lymph nodes. There they germinate. They kill, they kill the macrophage and initiate infection. The exotoxin production causes hemorrhagic mediastinitis, and pulmonary edema. So a diagnostic feature is a widened mediastinum, greater than eight centimeters. And the mortality for this is very high. Francisella tularensis causes tularemia. There's about 300 cases a year in the US, and there's about 90 cases a year of pneumonic tularemia. Remember, this causes rabbit fever. But in the pneumonic case, mortality is pretty high, about 60%. Yersinia pestis causes plague. 
Remember it has this bipolar staining that looks like safety pins. It's acquired from a flea bite or someone else with pneumonic plague. It has several virulence factors, F1 capsular protein, the YOPS proteins, and a type 3 secretion system. And pneumonia has a rapid course. Symptoms include first a mucoid sputum and then a bloody sputum. This leads to cyanosis and is fatal without treatment. Nicardia is a partially acid fast filamentous bacteria. You inhale it from the soil and if you have low white blood cells or low CD4 count, you have the risk of acquiring this. What we really worry about is hematogenous spread, particularly to the brain and spinal cord, where in these patients that have immunodeficiency, there's an 85% mortality. Atypical pneumonia is atypical because the patient tends to look good. They may not have a fever at all. They have a dry hacking cough instead of a purulent productive cough. We call this walking pneumonia. Mycoplasma pneumonia has absolutely no peptidoglycan layer. There's no cell wall, so they are resistant to beta-lactam antibiotics. They require sterols to grow. They form colonies on media that look like fried eggs. Patients develop cold agglutinins, which agglutinate red blood cells at 4 degrees but not at 37 degrees. This is only transient, though. This organism sets up shop with a P1 protein, which is on a tip appendage. It secretes hydrogen peroxide, which paralyzes the cilia, causing ciliostasis, and also death of cilia. So it causes pneumonia in less than 10% of the population. This is typically a young cohort, and the pneumonia is typically a bronchopneumonia. This is also responsible for many outbreaks in the U.S., particularly in tight quarters. Chlamydia are obligate intracellular bacteria that can't make ATP. They have a unique biphasic life cycle. Elementary bodies are taken into the cell. There they convert to reticulate bodies, they replicate, convert back to elementary bodies, the cell lyses, releasing elementary bodies. Because it's obligate intracellular, it's typically grown in McCoy cells, but not all labs are equipped to do this. So it typically causes bronchitis and mild atypical pneumonia. Chest radiographs may show patchy infiltrates. Chlamydia sataki causes psittacosis. It's also known as parrot fever. It can cause encephalitis, but that's much more rare than atypical walking pneumonia. Legionella pneumophila causes infections in older, debilitated patients. It's caused by inhaling aerosols of usually stagnant hot water, for example, from air conditioning, cooling tanks. There's no human-to-human -human transmission. It causes a necrotizing multifocal pneumonia. Oftentimes the patient has diarrhea, which is pretty rare for pneumonia. Hyponatremia is also an unusual symptom. Legionella can also cause Pontiac fever, but this is not an infection, but a reaction to inhaled components. Legionella can be grown in the lab in buffer charcoal yeast extract, BCYE medium. Coxiella burnetti causes Q fever. This is caused by inhaling dust or aerosols from farm animals, typically sheep, and particularly pregnant sheep. Q fever causes an atypical community-acquired pneumonia. However, the liver may also be affected, so the patient can also have hepatitis. Okay, on to viral pneumonia. Viral pneumonia is an atypical or interstitial pneumonia that often presents with fever, cough, chills, fatigue, malaise, and myalgia. Now, influenza is an important contributor to pneumonia. You have primary viral pneumonia, which is very serious but rare, and far more common are the secondary bacterial pneumonias that you see after influenza. These are caused by Streptococcus pneumoniae, which is the number one cause of secondary bacterial pneumonia after influenza, Staphylococcus aureus, which is number two, and Haemophilus influenzae. Now, secondary bacterial pneumonia is the most important cause of death after influenza, and most of those deaths occur after the age of 65. 
Measles virus is associated with a giant cell pneumonia in compromised individuals, but far, far more commonly are the secondary bacterial or even secondary viral pneumonias after measles. This is caused by measles virus-induced immunosuppression, which is a T-cell lymphopenia. The important causes of secondary bacterial pneumonia after measles are the same bacteria that cause secondary bacterial pneumonia after influenza. Cytomegalovirus or CMV causes pneumonia in compromised individuals, especially those who have undergone bone marrow or organ transplant. And of course, you're going to see those cells in the lungs with those owl's eyes, those nuclear inclusion bodies. Varicella zoster virus, which is related to CMV, causes chicken pox. But if an adult gets chicken pox, we really are worried because they may develop a viral pneumonia caused by inflammatory reactions to the virus. And we're particularly concerned because up to 30% of all deaths in adult with chicken pox are actually caused by the pneumonia. And similarly, up to 60% of deaths in measles are caused by the pneumonia. Coronavirus has that wonderful appearance where it looks like a crown under the microscope. Can cause pneumonia on its own. It can also cause a secondary bacterial pneumonia. And then you must remember that there are important serotypes that cause more serious infections like SARS and MERS. Hunter virus is a little bit different, and we're talking about Sinombre hunter virus here. It's transmitted in aerosols created by deer mice, and this is a disease where you see in particular pulmonary edema due to capillary leak caused by the virus infecting the endothelial cells of the blood vessels, particularly the capillaries. So that's viral pneumonia. On to fungal pneumonia. Fungal pneumonia occurs in compromised hosts and often presents with fever, cough, chest pain, malaise, headache, myalgia, weight loss, and remember in particular with the systemic um, fungi you can have hematogenous spread causing lesions in other parts of the body. So let's talk about the three systemic fungi first, starting with histoplasma capsulatum. In the environment you see hyphae with microconidia and these large tuberculate macroconidia. You inhale these microconidia from bird or bat enriched soils. So birds do not carry histoplasma, bats can. In both cases, the guano from these animals provides nitrogen to the soil which histoplasma needs to grow. So you inhale the microconidia into the lungs and they're ingested by alveolar macrophages, but they convert into a yeast form inside the macrophage. And you must remember that with this form of fungal pneumonia, you may have a widened mediastinum in those who are very ill. Now, systemic infection from hematogenous dissemination can result in skin lesions or lesions in the gastrointestinal, oral, or genital tracts. The second cause of fungal pneumonia is coccidioides immatus, and this is the organism that is in our areas because it's often found in California and Arizona. So it's found in desert sand and desert soil a few inches below the surface. So in this case, you inhale the arthrocnidia. So the arthrocnidia, you'll recall, are the spores that are produced by the breaking up of the hyphae. After you inhale the arthrocnidia, they develop into spherules in the lungs. And those spherules rupture to release the endospores that go on to create new spherules. And you will recall that with coccidioides immatus, that disseminated infection is far more likely in certain individuals, particularly African Americans, Filipinos, and Hispanics. And in disseminated infection, it often spreads to the skin where it mimics squamous cell carcinoma, or it can spread to other tissues, bones, joints, or meninges. Blastomyces dermatitis generally is a more serious form of fungal pneumonia. We think it's associated with rotting wood or rotting vegetation. In this case, you actually inhale the microconidia, and those microconidia are on these short little conidiophores normally attached to hyphae. 
But when you inhale the microconidia, they make their way into the lungs and they convert into this yeast form. And remember that these are big yeast with a big thick wall and they have this really broad based budding which differentiates it from all other yeast. When you have disseminated infection with blastomyces, you tend to have lesions in the skin that mimic squamous cell carcinoma or bone lesions. We're going to end with the opportunistic fungi, starting with Aspergillus fumigatus. This is a monomorphic filamentous fungus. It's found as hyphae with acute angle branching, usually less than 45 degree angles. It also has these airborne canidia that can be inhaled into the lungs. So it can cause allergic bronchopulmonary aspergillosis in people with asthma or allergies. And it grows on these brownish mucus plugs. So IgE will be high and eosinophilia may occur. It can also grow as a fungus ball or aspergilloma in somebody with a pre-existing lung cavity. So for instance, cavitary disease caused by TB. And then it can also cause a disease called farmer's lung, which is an allergic disease um, to this fungi and other bacteria and fungi found in silage. And then finally, if you inhale enough of the canidia into the lungs, you can get a fungal pneumonia. And in some individuals, this will hematogenously disseminate to the brain to cause chronic brain abscess. Cryptococcus neoformans is also monomorphic, but it's found just as a yeast. It's an encapsulated yeast with a polysaccharide capsule that can be seen really nicely in an India ink wet mount. Cryptococcus neoformans is found in soil enriched in pigeon droppings. It is in the pigeon droppings um, and it is inhaled into the lungs where it can cause a fungal pneumonia. It can also hematogenously disseminate to the meninges to cause cryptococcal meningitis, particularly in AIDS patients. And in patients with cryptococcal meningitis, you do not often see um, lung symptoms. Finally, Pneumocystis girovecchii is an extracellular yeast-like organism, and it has cholesterol instead of ergosterol in its cell wall. It is inhaled into the lungs, where it attaches to the alveolar wall, where it grows and is shed into the alveoli, where it appears like cysts and often appears like crushed ping pong balls.